Mark Davis from the School of Social Sciences at Monash University. And Mark came to speak to us, I think, possibly a year ago, is, I'm guessing, was roughly. March. Well, was it in March? Okay. <laughs> and and we, um, we really enjoyed his presentation back then and thought we, we need, there was so much more that we needed to learn from um, the style of work that Mark was doing and we we're very keen to get him back and keep um, in touch and find ways that we can um, collaborate more broadly. So um, welcome Mark and thank we're very, very interested much. to hear what you've got to say. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for inviting me here. Uh, John and I thought sitting this was actually, I'm a pacer. Okay, sorry about <laughs> that. <laughs> We thought because it's World um, Anthropological Awareness Week, we thought it was apposite that because I'm researching uh, public life on antimicrobial resistance that we talk about it. And I actually presented in March this year some very preliminary material from the, from the project. So today it's much more polished, well, hopefully, <laughs> much more polished and um, refined. And I'm actually trying to make a more integrated give you a more integrated picture of things. How do I move it along? And how do I stop that thing happening? Oh, is that the recording? Yeah, that's all just seems to be happening. Okay. That should disappear up there. Okay. Brilliant. <laughs> so, I want to present the findings from this analysis, uh, particularly around news media. And I'm going to step through a series of kind of uh, concepts that give you some historical con uh, context, thinking about what news media has actually been. You know, we've come, our culture has come from somewhere in terms of how we've uh, engaged with this idea of antibiotics and resistance. Talk a little bit about the role of the news media in public health and some questions there about, you know, what we can expect of news media as public health experts trying to influence publics. What is actually the role of the news in that kind of communication? It's been clear about that. I want to talk about this idea of multimodal narratives. So one of the one of the issues that we have to contend with in this field is not just newspapers anymore. It's not even just radio and television. We've got this kind of very complex, rich, digital news delivery that we need to start thinking about. Uh, and we not need to start thinking about image, uh, moving images, texts and meanings to kind of really engage with uh, what's going on in our media landscapes. And then a little bit about the rise of digital news and what might be some implications for how uh, newsworthiness uh, and the kind of audience engagement with ideas is actually being uh, shaped and re really kind of shaped through digital technologies. <clears throat> methods, you know, I did have a method for my analysis and I want to talk a little bit about that. Then I will give you a kind of picture of the kind of patterns uh, and narratives of AMR, AMR news in 2017 and I'll explain why, why I'm focusing on just one year, a bit later on. And then I'll reflect on what all of that might mean for uh, public awareness around antimicrobial resistance. So, uh, context. <clears throat> so this is, uh, I love going back into this old material. So this is 1944. Uh, it's the Sydney Morning Herald. Uh, and it's page two, not page one but pretty prominent, okay, in the news feed. And there's a quote here, it's, it's talking about the, the new legislation about making penicillin available to the general public. It's a new technology. Uh, and the excitement about that, the, the advertising, particularly in America, the excitement about what penicillin could do and how it saved people in wartime you know, with serious injuries. And then kind of some an interesting kind of little ripple or a wrinkle here around gonorrhea and penicillin way back in, in that period, in that wartime period. But why I'm interested in, I want to draw your attention to this particular article is that they've got a quotation here from Flory. 
So he was brought to Australia in 1944, I guess, when they were kind of doing the, the legislation. And he talks about, at that point, you know, uh, not everything's going to be cured <laughs> by penicillin. Uh, not everything will be controllable. And we know that organisms change uh, with, uh, with penicillin. And he talks about penicillin resistance here. Okay. And he refers back to the sulfanamide resistance that was observed in the 20s and so on. Sorry, am I knocking it? So I think the important point here is to recognise that we've been talking about, in terms of the public life of antibiotics, there has been both excitement and caution in the mix for quite some time. And media has a kind of history. So if we're thinking about what's happening in 2017 and what we can do next, we need to kind of be a little bit aware of the, the context. <clears throat> So, what do we know about what publics know? And this is a very kind of cursory sort of uh, kind of overview. The McCulloch review is probably the best thing we have. So they, inter they looked across a whole range of um, you know, surveys to kind of draw out <clears throat> the key points. Publics. <laughs> don't know terribly much about antimicrobial resistance, although we think it's improving. And the two, the graphics I've got are from the National Prescribing Service videos, the teddy bear one, which is just terrific, and the, um, the kind of history of antibiotics here as well. So we're doing quite a lot to inform publics, but there's still, there are still bits missing in what they know. <clears throat> one of the key things is this elision of habituation the habituation model of resistance with microbial resistance. So publics out there, they have a, they have a concept of resistance uh, that's aligned with, you know, caffeine, tobacco, heroin. You, your body becomes habituated to the substance, therefore it won't work. So that's the model they have when we say antimicrobial resistance. They start to think it's about their bodies. There's a kind of there's a whole set of scientific concepts that need to be mapped out for publics for them to get to the point where we are to understand how microbes evolve. We also know from all the other areas that we work in that these knowledges aren't just, you know, we're not all the same. We're different people by class, education, income, the kind of work we do, how we consume media, our language background, etc. All of those things are really uh, important to factor in when we're thinking about public awareness. So just as a kind of anecdote, uh, one of the people we spoke with, we've been speaking with in the qualitative work we're doing, a uh, sort of middle-aged Chinese man, had good conversational English. So the interview proceeded very, very well. We showed him uh, uh, a TV news video about antimicrobial resistance, showed it to him and asked him what he thought. He said, didn't understand it all too fast. So the kind of, uh, the nuances and how people engage with media and the language there is something we need to um, take account of. <clears throat> we also know that uh, when we do a public information campaign like the teddy bear campaign, uh, that the evidence for whether or not it's having impact is quite partial and fragmentary. It's very hard to evaluate these programs, very hard to know how much, they're, how much impact they're actually having. So all of those things kind of contextualise the public awareness, public knowledge uh, kind of domain for us. <clears throat> so if that's, if that's the kind of you know, sociological media public awareness a challenge, what does the news media do in this context? So, uh, you know, casting across the, the field to look at how people have conceptualised what news does in health. It's seen, uh, the news media, it can be, it, it, is an in, it is a source of information about health. And for many people, it might be the only one. Uh, it's an important source of AM, AMR information, according to some people. Others talk about 
you know, news media is when, where the general, you know, the great unwashed get access to science uh, and get new knowledge about the kind of emerging scientific uh, innovations. So news does play a role in kind of shaping the public consciousness around health and science and AMR. We also know from the effectiveness uh, research that's been done, the assess the evaluations that have been done, the earned media does improve impact. So if you run a social marketing campaign and, you know, morning television picks it up, uh, that's going to amplify, extend the impact of what you reach more people, repeat, you repeat the message, etc., and so forth. So we know that earned media has a role to play. So thinking about what news can do when we're up running public education is an important uh, thing to think through. And it makes sense, doesn't it? If we're going to do a media campaign informing publics about AMR, we need to start thinking about the, the media context. Do we go TV? Do we go printed? printed? Do we go digital? What are the options? Uh, and that what we, what we do has to harmonise with that media landscape. So for all those reasons, uh, AMR, the news media has a role to play. Uh, you know, and there are other justifications too in terms of setting the policy agenda. So we might not be influencing publics when we do a story about AMR, but we might be influencing important decision makers in the field so that they actually fund the next, uh, the next period of your uh, research funding, like when you're applying for an ARC grant. Um, so, public lack knowledge, news media, might have a role to play. What are they actually doing in this domain? What is the news media actually telling publics about AMR? So a variety of people have actually done textual analysis of what's actually in those news stories from different parts of the world. Uh, and the picture kind of, kind of gives you a picture that the news media only partly fits in with what we think publics need to know. So uh, in the US and Canada, uh, De Silva found very limited advice for publics, for individuals about what AMR, what they could do about AMR. It's a slight problem. So news about the kind of crisis, but nothing, you know, telling people what to do. Uh, but then we could start to think, well, journalists or media people might push back and say, is it our role to advise people Shouldn't we know our role is just to let them know there's something going on? It's up to us to educate them. So there's a kind of debate to be had there. Swedish, uh, uh, a lack of science. So, uh, you know, talking about AMR sort of unhooked from the science so that, you know, uh, publics can't really get to grips with the science behind uh, AMR and therefore kind of pushed into kind of myth myths and urban myths about what resistance actually is. An important uh, material from UK looking at the ways in which the news stories are constructed to externalise responsibility so the individual reading doesn't ever get the impression that actually this applies to them and that there are things they are doing and should do that might be part of the, the picture. There's always someone else's problem. The news media stories are kind of constructed that way. In India, uh, the news media was kind of, uh, um, <coughs> gee, that pizza is so tempting, um, uh, was controversy. So rather than talking about AMR and the kind of mobilising the public, it was actually, why has this new infection been called the New Delhi infection? So kind of political, national kind of struggle over that. Uh, and therefore calling into question the science getting into the science wars behind um, AMR. Uh, German, so we're finding this international picture in the ways in which uh, the, the, news, uh, the newspapers are actually talking about AMR. And a very recent article from Australian, Australians at Deakin actually, um, also found that Australian news kind of locates blame for AMR out with us, like the general relations somewhere else. Uh, and I think there are reasons why the news stories are constructed that way. 
So, thinking about historical context again, <clears throat> so that we can understand the situation we're in now. Uh, MRSA, Golden Staff, seems to be the, the, the kind of media point as we go back in the years and the decades from today, <laughs> go back in time, not as far back as Flory and penicillin in 1944, but you know, where was the kind of uh, media news interest kind of you know, peak around these kinds of issues? And it seems to have been 2005, both in the UK and Australia, and it's the Golden Staff MRSA debacle. And I think, uh, you know, the, the news culture is kind of set uh, in relation to how that story was constructed in that period. So, you know, <clears throat> 20 years ago or so. <clears throat> and various, lots of people have looked at it. No one in Australia has looked at MRSA in the, the mid 2000s. Maybe that's something I should do. But lots of UK people have looked at it with some very interesting uh, lessons for us when we're thinking about news in the contemporary moment. And you will see when I get into our da my data that a lot of the kind of things they're talking about are kind of just reverberating through. So 2005 was the peak and we've not really ever got back to that peak of interest. There's a common, common phenomenon in news is that there's a kind of global interest and then it tails off. So we're kind of in this kind of backspin of the peak maybe. Golden Staff was totally linked with uh, the dirty hospital metaphor and this kind of British uh, um, uh, preoccupation with bashing the NHS. The NHS is not good enough, it's not doing a good enough job, it's too costly, what are the what's the government doing about it? So Golden Staff in hospital settings was the kind of storytelling. Another thing that's very common in the kind of rhetoric about these stories was to give superbugs human-like kind of quality. Intelligence, craftiness, uh, intentionality. Superbugs do stuff to us as if they're thinking about it. Uh, and I don't know where microbial science is quite is at the moment. I'm not sure we're quite at that point that they're actually planning against us. Uh, so why, why do the superbugs have this kind of quality uh, in our kind of storytelling in the news? <clears throat> and what does that imply about what publics think? Lots of battle narrative. We've always, you know, John Dunn wrote a, you know, a poem about the flu and battles and so on. So we've, English language is played with this idea of war metaphors, but kind of more real. And we do it in news as well. How does that idea of kind of invader, uh, you know, uh, kind of bad invader coming into our, our lives, our nations, our bodies. What does that do about how we think about what's going on? Again, this kind of erasure, this story, this drama of um, superbugs is happening elsewhere, not in the individual's life. And also it keeps patching into this dirty hospital metaphor idea the politics around, you know, NHS and what that symbolises for, for the Brits. Uh, MR, MRSA is a kind of uh, flashpoint for ideas about social decline. You know, where are we going as, as societies? And there's a significant difference between uh, sort of talking about superbugs <coughs> and what we observe when we talk about other uh, global infections like h one n um, or even HIV now, really. So Sheldon Ongar has this kind of conceptualization of the media interest peak. And he talks about how you know, SARS, bird flu, swine flu, Ebola, uh, the first storytelling in the news is about to alert the population. There's this kind of mutation that's coming in. Then there's a kind of period of containment where public Publics are, you know, uh, people explain to public what people, scientists and public health professionals are doing to, you know, 
respond to the threat. And then a period in the later part of the storytelling, the news cycle, the public's are reassured. Okay, so what's distinct about the, the pattern there is the kind of disruption to the social order uh, symbolized in something like Ebola, a frightening infection. What's done about it, then a restoration, going back to the, you know, it's under control, we've kind of managed it, etc. So that's the emergence containment reassurance kind of package that frames the big, in, the big global infections. But we're not, we don't have that with MRSA. MRSA just keeps coming back. And so it's a powerful symbol of social decline in that sense. We don't seem to have been able to get on top of that. Uh, and at the very least, it's a very different kind of storytelling to uh, the swine flu Ebola storytelling. <clears throat> so just a little bit of media theory. And this is thinking about what's happening with news media itself. So, and I'm thinking about the economic and technological kind of uh, dynamics in the production of uh, news. <laughs> so, uh, it's kind of axiomatic uh, technology and economy of transforming media. We constantly told the poor old ABC <laughs> is in trouble because they have to move into the digital era. And I've got some data to show you what's happening with news media in Australia. So there's something big going on to how the news is fashioned. How do we think about that when we're thinking about public engagement, AMR? Uh, digital news is growing rapidly, spreading almost as quickly, more quickly perhaps than other things. And there's this concept of datification. So one of the things that happens with digital news is that journalists have, you know, news editors always had a sense of what was newsworthy based on how many, you know, you put Princess Diana on the front of your newspaper, you get more sales. Well, okay, we keep doing that. <clears throat> so we've always had that sense. But with digital technologies, the feedback to journalists is almost immediate. Okay, and they'll have data about uh, where people came from to click onto them on their story and where they go to next, how long they spend looking at that, that particular story. So how does that loop of datification of newsworthiness transform how the story is constructed? And how do we account for that in um, our concept, conceptualization of the role of news media in public health? So not only that, we also need to think about how rich actually news media options are. So this is this idea of narrative multimodality. The news is actually not just words. There are all sorts of ways in which uh, images and color, sound of voice, etc., is enriching the kind of ways in which we engage with news. And if we're, going, if we're serious about thinking about news and media, we need to kind of bring that into our analysis. So, you know, a uh, film, a uh, television, has a very kind of obvious narrative quality of beginning, middle, and end. You're kind of led through the story, through the sequence of the images, and the text of the journalist will help you through that. It's a very traditional way of telling a story, of conveying information. Printed news, similarly, get this narrative arc. I've read all of these. And it's not always there, I have to say, but there's a kind of principle of a narrative progression, even in a newspaper article. Digital news doesn't really have that quality or it interrupts uh, traditional ideas of storytelling because it's, you know, it's a page with different options and there are different things happening. And as we'll see, uh, digital news seems to be much more fragmented than the other forms of news storytelling with some implications for how we communicate about AMR. So how am I going for time? It's all right, pizza. So, <clears throat> because of that complexity I've been talking about, that's the main justification for just focusing on 27, to analyze television, newspapers, and then digital news together. <clears throat> 
and with digital news, we had to pick up all the videos embedded in that news. There was quite a lot of data to deal with. So to try and do that for the last 10 years, it just wasn't going to work. So we focused down on 2017. I think that gives us the depth of analysis, throwing up different kind of ways of thinking about what's going on. We were able to pull up all of the public and commercial broadcasters in Australia. And we identified not all of the newspapers, but the, the big ones in Australia and Victoria. And I also included the Geelong advertiser, just to kind of have a more regional mix. And in digital news as well, some complexities there. You know, we, we looked for the, the most frequently uh, visited news sites, but not all of them allowed us to actually, um, you know, download their stories because they were behind a paywall. Uh, the other difficulty here is that uh, different uh, news sites do have search um, engines for their sites. They don't perform in the same way. So if you do a Google search for ABC News and look for ABC News, it's searching for you get different results. Um, and also we, we, we found that depending on which computer we downloaded digital news on, the cookie set up on a different computers will actually determine what you've got to see. So there's some interesting, uh, where, you know, we think of the digital news is fragmentary, it's actually quite hard to get a consistent picture. You, we use the search terms, you know, obviously, antibiotic, flesh eating, golden staff, MRSA and superbug. And if we did that, <coughs> Uh, you know, from 2008 to 2017, we had 271 separate television news items. So that's 10 years. Printed news, 2,265. And then for digital, the other difficulty with digital news, you can't really search back that far. So we just went for 2017. So in that period, we got 12, you know, 1,206 different items. Yeah. Do you search a search like unadded search for scientific paper and pub yeah. Is there a similar kind of database? I have handy. We use Google and we use, uh, there's Google uh, News Search. And you can do a domain search so you can set the parameters and put in the, the URL of the news site. If it would let you in. So, um, you know, the Guardian, so I do I've got a list of the places we were able to get into. And you set the parameters, you do the searches, and it pulls up all of the items, and you can download them all. Okay. So that includes like TV or something that's like news clips. Oh, TV. TV news, there is a separate page of those. Right. Which are newspapers that are actually Which is you can actually look at the, the articles as well. Um, but for the digital news articles, it's done by hand, and you've got to go and retrieve the video as well. It's quite a difficult process. Yep. Um, so, did some of your printed news stories show up in the digital as well? So, for example, the fair sometimes it has to be uploaded from the web. So, if uh, it was the same story in the online age, we didn't count it twice. So, it was a printed age. And in the digital age, we didn't count it twice. But if it was the Herald Sun, and the other one, <laughs> I can't remember, news.com and Herald Sun are linked. So you often see the same thing. We kept that in because it's interesting that there are two sites for the same story. Keep that in the mix. I had to read everything. So this is partly me venting. I hope you don't mind. I don't want to do it again. <laughs> uh, um, what we did find though is that printed news and digital news doesn't really talk when the digital news began in Australia as compared to printed. So, uh, and that's because the style of reporting is completely different. It's a different kind of rhetoric, uh, etc. But I'll get into that. So, using the kind of applying a, you know, re removing identical sources, things that were completely irrelevant. You know, stories about antibiotics for sick, sick horses, we pulled those out. And we ended up with this map of um, 
materials from 2017. So here you can see uh, the variety of meter that we've looked at. And down the left-hand side, uh, it's interesting to look at the kind of proportion of uh, news, you know, the audience share of the different uh, commercial channels compared to the poor old ABC and SBS. The uh, five printed news uh, services that we were able to uh, get into, and we're looking at the sort of uh, that their readership indices, and we see that the Herald Sun is the dominant one there. And then we go into the digital domain. Look at the look at the you know the, the kind of numbers for number of visitors for the digital media as compared to the readership figures. Now, I don't know how you know there are issues about comparing those indices, but something's going on <laughs> in digital media. We haven't quite uh, got our heads around it. It's a lot more activity, and so we're able to pull up materials from news.com, abc.net, The Age. Um, Yahoo Channel 7 uh, service and the Herald Sun again. But then look at the right hand side, look at the, what we ended up with when we sorted out all the irrelevant stuff. For, for one, for 2017, 30 television items. Uh, across the printed news, 84. And then in the digital domain, 131. You know, we're supposed to be in a crisis. So you know, Lord O'Neill is telling us this is a global crisis. It's not really percolating through, We're not really seeing the interest here. Why is, why is that happening? So uh, if those of you who, who are familiar with qualitative methods, I read each one with some help and themed them and organized them, coded them, went back over them and looked at them. We, tra we uh, transcribed all of the videos so we could look at the texts and keep them in a relationship with the images themselves. And through a process of constant comparison of our themes, we came up with uh, you know, a justification for our themes to look at the kind of approaches. And we had in our heads also narrative multimodalities. We know that news is structured in a narrative way. So how is plot, character, cause and effect and morality all articulated through these stories. Uh, and once we were pretty confident we had a robust set of themes, we, we went back and did something I don't normally do, and that was to actually count, to apply an, an index uh, categorical code for the different items so that we could actually compare prevalence. So we started to see something that the pattern, we wanted to really kind of check it out when we did the analysis. <clears throat> so, this is my very beautiful graph. I have a research assistant who can do this stuff, which is fantastic. So, this is a plot over 2017, just the count of the different media. Television's at the bottom, <coughs> printed news is in between, and digital news is at the top. Um, we're thinking Antibiotics Awareness Week in November we're not getting a strong pattern of media activity. Might not be a bad thing, we just don't know what's going on there. We look at the flu season and then the peak of influenza. Also, is there a pattern here? Can you think it through? It doesn't seem there's a content related pattern. There might be a response in the media to flu, to this idea that people are getting sick, but they're not talking about the flu season. So there's a kind of uh, mismatch between what the media are doing and what we think is happening in the world. <clears throat> when we look at those items from Antibiotics Awareness Week, no one's talking about it. <laughs> is that bad or is that good? I don't know. Flu season is not a preoccupation, but there seem to be some kind of relationship. There's also stark or observable differences across media. They're doing different things. They're playing to a different audience. So public television, ABC, SBS, more authoritative and deliberative, more words in their, in their news item than in the commercial 
providers. Similarly, the age and the Australian, longer pieces, more science, so appealing to a different kind of audience compared to, say, the Sun Herald. Uh, the other thing I noticed too, with the age and the Australian and the big broadsheets, uh, the pieces would be named by journalists. The, the, the journalists would be named. Harold Sun, more often than not, the piece was anonymous. So there's a kind of different set of priorities about AMR and its science for the readership of the age and the Australian. We noticed that news.com and the age and the ABC were the most active digital kind of services. Interesting dynamics there. So there's a kind of class cultural capital issue about media services. So then we went back to look at July, this peak period when all media seemed to spike up, is what's going on. Uh, and it's not a clear picture. It's not like that all seized on one issue and reported it heavily. So there were only two stories that went across all media. And if you remember, there were the antibiotics overuse in infants. There was a kind of report in the pediatric journal about that. And then the drug resistant gonorrhea. Those were the only two stories that were carried across. There were many, many other stories that weren't. So then we looked at who did what. Antibiotics and infants was carried twice in, in the digital media three times on television and four times on printed news. I mean, I hesitate to overinterpret these really low figures, but there's a pattern here in terms of what digital media will do as opposed to TV and printed news. The gonorrhea story, however, seven items in digital news, one in printed and two on TV. But it's kind of curious what's going on there. Uh, there was a controversy about, remember that story about completion of courses? Yes. I'm just wondering whether that gonorrhea story is doing a bowling thing. You know, you've got the narrative after and you've got uh, something exciting, what are we doing? You maybe not have got to the other part of that yet, so it might just be MRSA in the future. I don't know. <laughs> the, the story's not over. Uh, yeah, I think so. I just think that the digital media, this is being recorded, isn't it? <laughs> Slightly more prurient and that clickbait orientation, sex sells the page. So, um, you know, I think there might be a dynamic there about the choices they make and then what they start to know about what we look at and that what they offer up. So maybe you know, public interested driving stories about gonorrhea and the digital, digital news. Whereas the other stories don't happen. Now, a lovely story about bacteriophage therapy, if that was the ABC. Uh, and then on digital news, strange stories of human Ken Dog, this guy who has a lot of plastic surgery, he had an MRSA infection, and this kind of grotesque examination of his life and who he is. Uh, and then a, a story also in digital news about whether it's be we should all be hand bumping now and not shaking hands because of superpowers. So there's a different kind of register of interest happening across the media. And this is the peak, this is July when there were the most stories. We're not getting this unification of storytelling at all. Also on content and what we've seen uh, obviously, TV is organised very differently. There's so lots of, uh, well, not lots, but you know, ABC, Four Corners, Catalyst, Landline, Behind the News, and the project all had a go at telling stories about superbugs, which is kind of worthy and interesting. And here we have conventional, you know, beginning, middle, and end sequences of images, scientists coming in and explaining, etc., and so forth. But then we have to think about, well, who's actually, it's us who are watching <laughs> these, where they're kind of preaching to the converted. Digital news, popular, ex exploding, very rich. There's a lot going on in these things. They're exciting to look at. There's videos and the layout and the colour and it moves and it changes. 
that there's a kind of non-linearity, the thinking narrative, how does the reader put together a storyline and a plot and think through things logically? When actually, it's a smorgasbord. They can go anywhere from whatever part of the story they like. <clears throat> so the kind of authority or the authorial voice is not clear. In a sense, the reader is writing, them, writing their own story as they progress through the, the images. And I think, we're, I think that, that digital news people are kind of serving that up. So there was a BMJ journal about Pe poor old Peppa Pig accessing antibiotics inappropriately <laughs> in one of the cartoons, and it was talked about the BMJ. So the news media really got into this. But when they talked about it, they just slammed in a kind of trailer from Peppa the Pig. So you get this kind of fragmentation that the, the video didn't really link with what the story was about and actually didn't tell anyone anything about antibiotics. It's more really about Peppa Pig. And she's a draw, yeah? So people want to look. Another one was this kind of disparity or this kind of illo illogical kind of connection. So a woman amputee, but then the video that was included was about a parasite infection from a tourist. So this is kind of a you know, hoovering up, assembling a kind of smorgasbord that may not have an interior logic, unlike Four Corners, perhaps. So we need to start engaging with what's going on there. How are we doing? Shall I keep going? I realise I'm, I'm talking quite a lot. I'm, I'm animated about it because I'm getting to it. So this is the narrative analysis tabulated for you. And what we decided that there were kind of five main stories being kind of the story approaches. So I've talked about the patterns in the media. Now I want to talk about the narrative styles or themes. Decline, discovery, alert, advice, and survivor. Now these are very familiar tropes with new storytelling. Just decline goes back into what I talked about in terms of MRSA and kind of social decline and superbugs as a kind of image of that. Discovery is more about stories that talk about science and scientists and what they're finding. And as we'll see, this is a dominant theme of the storytelling. And it's kind of divided between sort of orthodox stories of, you know, nature has discovered this, you know, there's a, an article in nature and this is what the scientist has discovered, through to sort of the kind of weird science, like Neanderthals apparently used antibiotics, etc. So the kind of strange mixture of kind of approaches to science. Oh, it's a question. <laughs> Thanks, Leslie. <laughs> yeah. Um, alert. So this is a more kind of pointed kind of version of discovery when someone's, that someone reports on something happening that might impact on us. So the classic one is we're facing the antibiotic apocalypse now. Then there are stories that include in them advice for us, you know, happily, as public health people, there is some talk for the public about what they can do uh, and messages that come at the end, typically at the end of these stories about hand washing and antibiotic use. And then stories that kind of talk about people who've had these infections and what they've done, and the kind of human interest coming through. Now, the important thing to recognize is that some stories might have different elements of these themes. So they're not mutually exclusive. So the figures I'll show you don't add up because some items will do just about everything at the same time. But it's important to get to grips with, you know, how the story is being packaged for publics and what the emphases are. So decline, <clears throat> we observe this in 45% of the media we are. So quite a dominant story, a kind of preoccupation almost. 
So the classic one, the world is facing antibiotic apocalypse. But what I'd like to show you, and this is from a digital news item. So this is how the item was framed. I want to show you the, the embedded video to get you thinking about you know, how Golden Staff is explained in this video. So hopefully it will work. <laughs> So why have I, why I've shown you this is to, uh, you know, if we frame a story as a decline story, the apocalypse is coming and then tell people they can't have antibiotics and yet, and they also have to clean their hands. Are we linking those messages with apocalypse? Are we kind of, <laughs> you know, we want people to change their behaviors. Is this the best way to frame a positive change? So that whenever someone washes their hands, they're thinking well, the apocalypse is coming. <laughs> so, yeah. I go to the doctor, but I can't have my antibiotics because of the apocalypse. So, you know, is public engagement kind of helped here? Is a question I would have. <clears throat> Discovery. So this is the kind of scientific theme. And it was the dominant one. So two thirds of the articles we found across media reported on new science. So the journalists I spoke to, this is how they shape a story for AMR. They most typically justify it with their editor because it's something that's been reported in Nature or the BMJ or the MJA. And that way they can get the story out. So there's a kind of conduit between actually <laughs> what we're doing to promote our science in the media journalists and then the representation of AMR. It's packaged as a scientific story. You know, lots of examples, you know, lots of uh, breakthrough kind of discourse, discovery discourse, et cetera, and so forth. Does that way of, pack, you know, does the idea of scientific discovery appeal to a particular kind of reader? You know, uh, who in the general population is also interested in science. If AMR is always a kind of hook for science, does that mean actually it's not AMR that's the story, it's science. And it's kind of um, uh, addressed to all of the current social and biomedical problems of the world, that's actually the story. AMR is just part of that. When we think back to what we know, what publics don't know about AMR, it kind of starts to hang together that the strong story about AMR is not really there. Alert, 12%. So again, this kind of, we think there's a global crisis, uh, but it's not really coming through very strongly. And typically when there's some kind of alert around, you know, the crisis for premature babies or the woman who died in the United States earlier last year, then there's a kind of point of, well, this is real, it's happening, what should we do about it? Um, advice, 20%. 20% of the news items that we've collected, one in five, have some messaging about what you and I can do. When we look at what they actually say, there are questions about the quality of that. Does 20% sound like a lot? or a little to you, what do you think? I mean, should all news stories about AMR have some messaging about what people do or not? I just wanna show you an item that's also embedded in digital media across, the, across last year. And it was uh, repeated five or six times. And that's why I'm showing it to you because it's a kind of 
you know, in this kind of assemblage of a story in the digital environment, the news journalist would go for videos that they could put in, and they've been going for this one. So, you know, what's the messaging here? Imagine surviving major surgery than dying from a basic skin infection. That's the reality our world is facing with antibiotic resistance predicted to kill 300 million people by 2050. Experts say that unless we change the way we're using antibiotics, we're taking the cover. So, why is this happening? At the moment, we're all taking far more antibiotics than we actually need. Resistance happens when bacteria change to protect themselves from the effects of antibiotics. So eventually, the drugs have minimal to no impact for the person taking them. The more a person takes antibiotics, the more opportunity bacteria have to become resistant. While experts know resistance is unavoidable, they're worried about how quickly it's happening. In 2014, almost half the Yogi population was prescribed an antibiotic. Although they only work on bacterial infections, patients are pressuring doctors to prescribe antibiotics for viral infections like flus and coughs. Developing antibiotics could slow resistance but it can take eight to 12 years and cost more than $700 million for each new drug. Not only that, but strains of bacteria will become resistant to the new antibiotics within two to three years anyway. Instead, we should be taking antibiotics only when we need them and using them properly when we do by taking the entire course. As always, prevention is key. So doing things like having good hand hygiene, keeping your vaccinations up to date and staying in good shape will keep the infections away in the first place. That's probably the longest video I found. And as I said, it's been repeated quite a lot, so picked up quite a lot uh, and used quite repeatedly. I guess the journalist who created it spent a lot of time, uh, you know, making it, <laughs> so they wanted to use it. And we could think about how the message is, this is where the real action is in terms of explaining what people can do. It's not really in the stories themselves. Imagine surviving major surgery. Yeah, please. Absolutely. So if we look closely at these items, uh, more often than not, and we refer to an expert, we're actually going to find them. So Colin Yong, Alan Cheng, people like that, Turnage, will appear again and again in these stories as the kind of exemplification of authority and expertise. So the journalists don't really want to, they're reporting it, and not they don't really have a stake in public health. So it's interesting, you know, what, what role does news media have? So just finally, I know I'm really uh, uh, going quite a long time. The final story telling, it's kind of important, is around survivor stories. So this is the familiar, you know, patient testimonial, this happened to me and this is what, how I survived. Look at the digital media, there's a kind of, this pastiche effect is also happening. So there was a, an article on the 1st of June in the uh, <coughs> uh, 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 Yahoo News. Man with new tattoo goes swimming, dies from flesh-eating bacteria. And then the pictures were provided. And the pictures were from uh, a BMJ case report. So they found a BMJ article and just put it, and the guy, was it Port Phillip Bay? It was the Gulf of Mexico. So, you know, where people go to to kind of create a story for Australian audiences, there are a question, there's a question mark about how relevant that is. Why is that news for Australians? <clears throat> is it because it was repeated across Yahoo News throughout the world? Another one was a mother who had her hands and feet amputated after contracting the flesh-eating virus. And she's interviewed to, as if to talk about her experience as a horror story. And the, the story is framed in that way. I'm wondering if, you know, the digital media and its kind of movement towards the public interest, you know, their version of newsworthiness is to play with this kind of horror idea. So, you know, AMR News, 
knowledge about AMR is less a priority than this kind of attracting a particular kind of audience. So there are questions there about what's happening in the digital media. So I'll wrap it up. I know you want to have pizza. Uh, AMR news is regular, but low frequency. And that pattern's been set for a long time. There are some source specific effects in terms of newsworthiness and how the narrative is told that seems to suggest audience segmentation, a preaching to the converted and a kind of fragmentation of uh, the, the rest of the news audience. Digital media is growing, but it lacks the narrative linearity we're used to. And you know, the scope for mounting these uh, strong stories about AMR is questionable. AMR really just does seem to be mostly a hook for science reporting rather than a story in its own right. So it's kind of the golden staff crisis in 2005 is kind of being merged into regular reporting from the science community about uh, new innovations. And this can move between kind of very orthodox science through to kind of do people remember the sea, uh, the sea turtles with the bacteria on their shells? That was an important story for a while. And then there's something about the looping, the looping effect of, of datification of newsworthiness. So consumer choices and the, how the media responds to those choices might be creating these kind of bubbles or loops of storytelling. And we end up with things like the human Ken doll and Pe Pe Pepper the pig. This kind of dynamic happening in the digital media. So we can talk about this, and I'm still thinking about it. These profound economic, technological, historical, and cultural circumstances, we'd have to, you know, to shift them, we'd have to do something really radical. You know, will AMR make the front page? Penicillin did, but we're a long time from that. Maybe we have to just work with what we've got. Uh, you know, can we generate materials that news media can embed in the kind of assemblages that they're prone to make? Can we actually serve up better material? And certainly there's a lot of it around, but how do we get it into the news feeds? Maybe we need to reconceptualize how we think about uh, public engagement and what the media does and what the news media does. You know, maybe a network model rather than a transmission model, the old mass media concept of transmission, set that aside. Think about the way networks are produced, the networking between media and the kind of audiences that are constructed so that we can kind of get people into pathways and networks that would inform them about health and about AMR. And that would mean that we'd be thinking not so much about the content and the message, but the skills and tools to get people into those networks using them profitably, a kind of like a digital literacy. Uh, and maybe thinking about particular groups of people and their networks and what they need when, you know, so young mothers, mother groups are talking all the time about how to support each other. Is there a kind of role there for kind of promoting information? And we also need to think about this possible stratification so the kind of fragmentation of the story, the audience fragmentation, and what's happening there, some misunderstandings, which were losing part of the audience uh, because of the way the media works. Uh, so those are just some thoughts about the agenda that we might uh, have for the future. I just want to acknowledge my colleagues at Monash and at the University of Gothenburg and Glasgow Caledonian University. Uh, and that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. That's all right. Thank you very much. And um, I think lots of uh, food for thought for us um, in thinking about how we might engage in particularly digital media platforms, um, which some of us are sort of uh, a bit less familiar with. Um, I wonder, I know we haven't got much time, but for those in the room, are there any burning questions people wanted to ask? I actually um, have a comment for you. Yeah. Um, so I worked with uh, Television New Zealand for two years. Oh, and right. news. Yeah. 
Uh, and so the way that we develop the news for, you know, the o'clock news or the morning news, radio show, et cetera, et cetera, is that we have a set standard. So you have X minutes, then a break, then X minutes, and then a break. There's an important story. There's an important story, you know, the news story. And then there's the full story. And so the filler story is the one that some of us spend a lot of time searching the internet to find something that's good or interesting, that sparks the editor's mind, that must have a picture associated with it. So that tends to become the filler story that sits in there. And I suspect knowing the stuff that was kept and thrown in there, there's two things to this. Firstly, they are media people. They have zero training in health, in medicine, in veterinary science, in science, in biology. Because when I would be going, oh, that, you know, because of course I'm a vet, so I'm sitting there going, you know, that's really, you know. And you see, the problem is our editors, and it's new cells, and it's all about getting new viewers onto telly. So, excuse me, cynicism, hence the reason I don't stop working in, in the news. Um, it's all about how many people are going to view tonight. So, what is sexy, and it, it's already in the media because it's, it's all about time, right? So, if you're in New Zealand and a story's there, we can do it first. So, then if we can get hits and news, and then it's like everyone's watching everything, and you have no idea, like they have these rooms. There's just feeds from every television station in the world, globally, going constantly, and now they're literally going snip, 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 snip. We can do that. No, no, we can't do that. No, 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 we can't do that. Snip, snip, snip. And then they feel all that, and then they decide what goes on the news. So sorry, there's a whole bunch of that going on amongst all of this stuff, yeah. which is why AMR is a. It doesn't have many pictures. It's not what it has but a it's no, no, but, it, but it's yeah. the horror story, you know. Yeah, yeah, that's a super horror story. Yeah. It's a, wow, that guy with a tattoo. Oh, look at that, bro. Can we put that on TV? Yeah. Can we put that here? And the other thing is the digital people that do the digital part for the news, so the TV guys, they see nothing, are a completely different group. That's a completely okay. different editor. Yeah. It's the web guys that are doing the actual website stuff versus the media news bit are all the different parts of the building. They don't talk. No. They're not part of the same news, no. so they are not sharing the same story. When, uh, I think some journalists do develop a, a, a role as a science journalist or a health journalist, but that's mainly the broad sheet. Yeah. They've all been killed off in the last yes. 10 years. Yeah. So the other, I mean, we talk about the other dynamic is that the kind of industry it's just media yeah, and so yeah. on. So I've been trying to talk to key health journalists in Australia that they don't work for me. You know what I'm saying? Uh, oh, I know. So it used to be a prestigious yeah. journalistic role to be the health editor for the age and have five people in the team. Now there's one and they also have to do something. Yeah, yeah and it's moved, it's changed a lot. Yeah. Uh, quick case study for this week in your conclusions. So the one that you put up that I was suggesting you could have a repackaged expert by body and soul. Mm. So this week the federal government wanted to encourage um, parents to immunise their children against um, meningococcal disease. So they partnered with the Australian Academy of Sciences who did the video. I guess that's what I was saying, rather than body and soul, you can, I don't know if there's any way, a lot of organisations can't have their own video production thing, but they partnered and so all that's gone out on their website. So hopefully in the future if there's a meningococcal disease, instead of going to body and soul, they might use uh, use that one. And yeah. I don't know whether that's the way AMR, if you could partner with someone like the Academy of Sciences. They obviously have they've got really cool videos, they might have um, a photographer or a team or someone who knows what they're doing. You could maybe have package it into one of your stories and then it might become something that gets um, yeah. Oh I was thinking about the same thing. I think because there are few agendas now, it's easier for journalists to take something information that's been presented. 
and recognition, and therefore that leads to a reference for discovery stories where new data is presented um, yeah. and you can change it. So it's harder to for me to focus on uh, ongoing behavior change type issues um, because they're relying on the discovery stories um, and the information that I agree. I think that's what's going on. That's how they get this word ISO every time. Oh, it's in nature. It's an expert. It's like real class. They only, they only look at those top journals, apparently. Well, I've done the history of Australia and all the techniques that are published in the journal. It's really nothing to do with what you're doing. It's not anything. It's not anything. It's not anything. It's not anything. So, we'll never make it. Mm. so I mean, that's quite the biggest, the big question though is like, well, okay, news news is a significant player in public consciousness. I don't know how we work with that. And what would be the effect of the news? Is it common issue? We have to other strategy. Yeah. Sorry, we have one question. Yep. Um, it's about podcasts yeah. and, and radio. What's what's the role of radio? In well, uh, we didn't look at radio on purpose because it's so complex. It was complicated enough. Um, radio is very ephemeral, as, as Leslie mentions there. Uh, we're creating our own radio podcast, by the way, with this project. So based on the interviews we did, we kind of create some media and a radio documentary. Which is kind of, and we will talk about these things. Documentary about working there and what patients think and what we think about the issue. Not so much. Maybe visit them. Um, but I really take that point. Radio, uh, you know, podcast is having its day. People are using their mobile phones, etc. I guess we're going to have to call it to a halt, but Thank you very much. No problem. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.